probably three, four years ago now, um, Doris Gregory went in to get her hair done one day and the uh, lady who did it for her was named Rachel. Absolutely new believer in Christ, looking for how she could grow and Doris invited her to our church where we had the privilege to get to know Rachel over the next year to two, something like that. And then a year and a half ago, here came Renee along from Guatemala and captured her heart and eventually captured her and uh, took her to Guatemala where they now reside, but they do, they are absolutely missionaries. Um, you'd never guess it, but Renee does uh, concerts occasionally. He and his brother Diego, who's kind of a master on the guitar, uh, lead worship services. They've been, they, they, just, they just came uh, here, home to Colorado for Rachel, uh, from uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where they were involved in some church work down there, some recovery work. Rachel gives her testimony. Um, Renee speaks. They've seen numerous people coming to know Christ as their Savior through the ministry that they've had just in the last few days and weeks. And, uh, and yet they're living day to day. Um, so one of the things they need, they didn't tell me to do this, but if you'd like to help them financially, they'd probably love it, see them after the service, but uh, pray for them is the main thing as God has poured out his spirit upon them. So welcome. We're really glad to have you guys here today. And I think they have a few friends and family around as well. So uh, God bless. All right. Would you stand with me as we look at Luke chapter 11? I'm going to be reading this morning Luke 11, beginning in verse 14. Now Jesus was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke. And the people marveled. But some of them said he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. While others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. Let's pray. Father, it's um, in some ways a bit of a strange passage of Scripture that we come to today. And yet not strange, certainly not from your perspective. Actually opens the curtain and reveals realities that are going on all around us that we never see and many times in our particular country never even contemplate. Forgive us. Help us to see reality as you see it. Father, as we, as we come to your word this morning, I pray that you will hide the messenger and that you will reveal yourself through your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> Some of you may have heard of the uh, Civil War veteran who had family on both sides, which was not an unusual occurrence, of course, during those days. He couldn't decide which way to go. He didn't have particular political sympathies that took him one way or the other, but uh, he knew he was just of the age where he was going to have to fight. So he finally dressed in Union blue pants and Confederate gray shirt thought he would declare neutrality. So, of course, the Rebs shot him in the legs and the Yankees shot him in the chest, right? 
when war is in your backyard, you can't remain neutral. And that's what this passage of Scripture is about. The spiritual warfare that envelops us is everywhere. In our world today, if you were in other countries, you would see it very clearly because people are literally and physically dying for their faith. We see it highlighted these days because of ISIS involvement, but it's been going on and will continue to go on forever. And in our world, certainly as much as ever, it is a real and present warfare. We're in a bubble in our country. We don't see the warfare as other people see it. But beloved, it's just as real, it's just as present. The Bible in Colossians 1, Paul talks about it as being the difference between the domain of light, of the Son of God, and the domain of darkness. The kingdom of evil and the kingdom of light. The empire of Satan and the empire of God. God has already won the war at the cross, that's the good news. But for purposes of his greater glory that we don't understand yet, but will one day, the battle rages until he says, enough, enough. And the day will come when he says that, just as the day came when he resurrected his son from the dead. Now the world we live in is right in the middle of all of this going on, right? C.S. Lewis says it this way. He says, enemy occupied territory. That is what this world is. Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed, Jesus, and is calling us all to take part in a great campaign of sabotage, <laughs> which we just had, <clears throat> I guess. Sabotage, to take it back. That leaves it with, with two questions, beloved. The first question is, which side are we on, right? We have to decide. Are we on God's side, or are we on Satan's side? Now, some of you say, well, Satan, I don't even believe in Satan. Doesn't matter whether you believe in him or not, right? We've spent time before emphasizing the reality of Satan, and certainly from God's perspective, from the perspective of the Bible, and you can't look around our world very long and not say, yes, he is real. He is real. So you have to decide. Is it going to be God's side or is it going to be the side of Satan and self? Now there's an illusion that there's a middle ground called self. I realize that. We all think we, we're our own number one. We're the captain of our own soul. But from the biblical perspective, self is in the kingdom of darkness. Self is the rebellion against God. My desire to be my own God is exactly what took Adam and Eve down the road of sin in Genesis 3, right? <laughs> Satan told them, you will become like God if you do this. And we have been trying to be our own God ever since. Self is not a middle ground. Self is in the domain of darkness. And so we are called upon to choose, to choose for God. Now, once we have chosen for God, there becomes another issue, the second issue, which is, so now, if we have really given our life and our heart and our soul and our mind to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, are we going to live in our new present or are we going to live in our old past? What will be the nature of our behavior? What will be the nature of our thought processes and our lifestyles? What will it be? So those are the two questions that face us. And this passage is because we're in enemy-occupied territory, and it's very easy to compromise, even as a believer, this passage is about how we can have continued victory against the domain of darkness, both in terms of how we escape it in the first place, and secondly, how we stay out of its clutches afterwards. Five principles for overcoming evil we will see in these next verses. We're going to take the first three today. We'll take the next two next week. Principle number one, evil does not cast out evil. Evil does not cast out evil. Notice that after Jesus casts out this demon 
that had caused this man to be mute, not able to speak all of his life, the people marveled. The amazing has, you know, by the time we're this far in the book of Luke, the amazing has become so commonplace that we kind of just, you know, shine it on. But these people who saw this miracle in this particular day did what many had been doing up until this time. They were marveling at what they had seen and at what had happened. But that wasn't 100% anymore. The crowds are now beginning to show some signs of opposition, and there is some sign of opposition here. The crowds are beginning to be mixed a little bit. And for the first time, we see what Jesus' kind of deadly enemies, the Pharisees, as they're going to become from this point on, we see the story that they've concocted to discredit him. Found in verse 15. It says, But some of them said, He casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. Now, we'll talk about Beelzebul in just a second, but the most important thing to see here, dear friends, is, is, that, is, is to see that what they didn't do was say, oh, he didn't really do a miracle. This didn't really happen. This was just a, this was just, this was just a, some form of magic, or it was some accident that this guy couldn't speak and Jesus figured out a way to get him to speak. They, they didn't say that. In fact, interestingly enough, nowhere ever in the record of Scripture does anyone ever question the miracles of Jesus Christ. We do today, from, from 2,000 years distance, it's kind of easy to do that, right? To say, well, it was, just, you know, it was just what people thought. It's what somebody wrote down. But it never happened in the time of Christ while it was going on. They don't deny the miracles because the miracles were undeniable. They were going on over and over again, and they were undeniable and they could never catch Jesus in any moral or legal issues. Every effort to discredit him has failed, and so they come up with this concocted story. This is their last resort. He casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. So, first question, who in the world is Beelzebul, right? What is that all about? Well, if you were to go to look, to, to, and don't, but if you were to go to look at 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1, you would see that there's, a, there's an ancient Philistine god, the ancient Israelite enemies, the Philistines, as they came into the land of Canaan, an ancient Philistine god named Baal Zebub. Baal Zebub, which means Baal, the exalted one. We've all heard of the god Baal in the Old Testament, and that's what that name meant. They were exalting their god with his name. Well, the Jews who hated the Philistines had just rearranged a couple letters in that name and turned it in to Beelzebul, which means the Lord of the flies or the Lord of dung. You don't have to be around the cows or the horses or pigs very long to know what that's all about, right? So this was a great insult that they had renamed the Philistine God cleverly. But over time, that name Beelzebul sort of became Yiddish slang for Satan. And so by the time of Christ, they commonly used that name to speak of that. So here are these enemies of Christ, unable to deny his miracles, unable to catch him in any legal or moral impropriety, looking for a way to discredit him, saying essentially to the people, I know you guys, you guys think that he's doing these miracles empowered by God. You think he's great? Let us tell you about him. He's not doing these miracles by God. He's doing these miracles by Satan himself. He's just an imposter. He's come among you to fool you and to deceive you and to take, the route, take you down the road of destruction. Don't follow him. You'll be foolish if you follow him. It was enough to get a few people on the fence. Look at verse 16. It says, while others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven... Jesus is going to come back and talk about that in verse 29, so we'll deal with that when we get to verse 29. But first he deals with the accusation. He deals with the accusation that he's doing his miracles by the power of Satan, and he deals with it in three different ways here in this passage. First of all, he notes that if he were casting out demons by the power of Satan, then the devil would be working against himself. He says, why would 
Satan never do that. Look what he says in verse 17. He says, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. The divided household falls. And if Satan is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. Maybe Satan would allow somebody like Jesus to do a miracle or two to lead people down a road, right? But Jesus, by this time, beloved, is two and a half years on this earth in his ministry time. He's been casting out demons all across the land of Palestine. He's left devastation in his wake. This is no con game. And the people know that. You know, I used to, um, I love baseball. I've got a bunch of guys up here that love baseball. Every time I ask them what's their favorite hobby, I get baseball or basketball or sports of some kind. I was like that. So I, I used to play shortstop, usually or first base, and, and pitch quite a bit. I can tell you one thing about pitching. I never, ever released a pitch with the hope that the batter was going to tag one, right? Never. Never said, oh, I hope he gets this one. That would be a house divided against itself, right? Now, so I was pitching one day to my three-year-old granddaughter, Megan, a few years later. Finally found somebody I could get out. <laughs> so, so Megan and I are playing ball. We have this big Nerf ball, and she has this huge bat, and uh, so, so basically she just has to swing, and she's going to hit it, and she's you know, hitting a few, and she'll miss a few, and then she'll hit a couple, miss one, hit a couple more, but about, about halfway through our time, about five in a row, she missed. She missed about five in a row. So she picked up that ball, she threw it back to me, and then she put her little hand on her little hip, and she said, Grandpa, you're supposed to hit my bat. <laughs> Casting blame, right? Sound familiar? She didn't understand yet, pitchers don't help hitters. Satan wasn't helping Jesus. That's Jesus' first point in this charge against him. Divided houses don't stand. He gives a second answer in verse 19. He says, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. Turn with me to Acts 19. If you're in Luke, go to John and then Acts. Next two, two books over. Acts 19. Judaism had exorcists. Now, keep in mind, and we've talked about this before, the demonic activity during the time of Christ was, had reached a fever pitch, beloved. And I think one of the reasons was because here's the Son of God in the flesh come to earth and Satan has turned up the volume just as well because he sees that God has done the same thing. And so I think this was a time that the earth experienced this kind of activity as never before. And Judaism had its own exorcist to try to deal with the issue. Naturally, they also assigned other things that we would know today of as medical conditions to demons. <coughs> but they had their exorcist. They experienced from all appearances... And from everything you can read in secular history, they, they, they experienced little, if any, success. You see an example of this in Acts 19. Paul has arrived uh, on one of his missionary journeys. We're skipping ahead a little bit now after the time of Christ. Paul has arrived on a missionary journey in the city of Ephesus. And when he gets there, he is casting out demons there in the name of Jesus. Now notice what happens beginning in verse 13. Well, let's start in verse 11. Acts 19, verse 11. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Amazing things were going on in Ephesus at this point in time, validating the ministry of this apostle. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists, the guys that Jesus was talking about, they undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the name of Jesus, whom Paul proclaims. In other words, 
They were having little success with their own incantations and spells and all the rest of it, the things that they used. So they decided, hey, here's a new way. Paul's having great success with this. I think I'll try it. Notice verse 14. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. I love this next part. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I recognize. But who are you? I don't think I know you. And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Don't you love it? That's the kind of exorcism that Jesus is talking about when he says, okay, so your sons are doing this too. And what Jesus is really saying to these enemies of his who have sons and colleagues who are claiming to be exorcists, he's saying, listen, let me ask you guys a question. If you say that I, who never fail, am casting out demons by the power of Satan, who in the world is underpowering the pathetic attempt of your own exorcists to cast them out. If they claim that God empowered the failures, then God must be empowering the great success that Jesus was having, right? They're caught on the horns of an absolute dilemma. Thus the failure of their own exorcists brought judgment against them. That's what Jesus is talking about in Luke 11. So let's turn back there, Luke 11. Jesus makes a final point in verse 20. His final point is this. He says, if, if you've got a strong man, someone is guarding uh, his house and he's guarding some treasures that he has in that house, he's intent on protecting what's there, and then someone who is stronger comes along, breaks in, takes the things that are there, then the one that comes and takes those things must be stronger yet than the one that was guarding the house. His point is, since Jesus is ordering demons around all over Palestine like they were new recruits at a boot camp, then he must be stronger than the demons. And he must be stronger than the leader of the demons. Because they have to obey by every measure that you can apply. Jesus is acting by the power of God. That's his point. He's not casting out demons by the prince of demons. He's casting out demons by the power of God. So what's the principle? The principle behind all of this. What's Jesus wanting us to know? What is he saying? What he's saying is this, beloved. Evil does not work against evil. Evil does not cast out evil. So for those who are not believers, what's the implication? never really given your life to Christ. You've never acknowledged him as your Lord and Savior. You have not bowed the knee to him in this life. What's the implication? The implication is that if you are to be freed from the kingdom of darkness, it has to be through the power of Jesus Christ. It can never be through your own power. You cannot work your way out of the kingdom of darkness. If that's what you think you're doing, you just as well give up now. Satan is certainly stronger than you. The powers of evil are stronger than you. The power of self is stronger than you. That's why every New Year's resolution you make is done by the third week of January. Because you can't even keep the things that you want to do right, right. And we're all in the same boat. And the reason is, even though we've been told and our society has told us and our culture tells us routinely now that we are basically good people who just do bad things occasionally, the Bible says, no, you're bad people who occasionally happen to do a good thing. And the Bible goes further and says, and by the way, absolutely, most of the time, even your good things are selfishly motivated. They're not really good things. They're just evil things in, in disguise. That's why the Bible says your heart is deceitful above all things. It will deceive you into thinking you're a good person when you are not. It will deceive you. And it's not only deceitful, it's desperately sick. The word really means terminally ill. It's describing the condition of spiritual death that we're all born into. You don't have to do anything to get into the kingdom of darkness. That's where you're born. David says in 
Sin did my mother conceive me in Psalm 51, verse 5. You don't have to do anything to be an evil person. You, you are, just like all the rest of us. And your attempts to be good enough to meet God have failed from the very moment that you did your first sin because God says those who are going to be saved by keeping the law in Galatians 3, he says that, that all you got to do is keep the whole law all the time, every time, never make a mistake, never fail, because the standard is the glory of God and you have fallen short, according to Romans 3.23, which we memorized, right? For the, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is who we are outside of Christ. So there's no escape, humanly speaking. That's why we need Jesus. We need the redemption that only he can bring. I love this story about R.A. Torrey. Was, he was an evangelist. In the early days, he established uh, the school I went to out in California, but he was, he was an evangelist in the early days of the 20th century. And he was preaching one time to a crowd, and somebody stood up somewhere in the meeting and said, and said, um, said I'm, sir, I'm an atheist. I'm an atheist, and I don't believe that your Christianity can stand up to reason. It defies reason, so I challenge you to a debate. Well, you're, you're standing there in front of a whole bunch of people, right? And this guy has raised this challenge. What are you going to do? Tory said this. He said, hey, I accept your challenge because I believe Christianity does stand up to reason much better than atheism. I accept your challenge. I will see you here tomorrow night. But I have one condition. You bring a hundred people whose lives have been transformed by atheism. And I'll bring a hundred people whose lives have been transformed by Christ. Whose addictions have been taken away. Whose, who have been involved in prostitution or drunkenness and they have now been able to rid themselves of that through the power of Jesus Christ, who are just normal, everyday, selfish people whose marriages are falling apart because of their own selfishness, whose, whose lives have been transformed and redeemed by the power of Jesus Christ. I'll bring a hundred of those, you bring a hundred of yours, and, and we'll meet here tomorrow night. Tori's still waiting. He's dead, but he's still waiting. Why? Because evil does not cast out evil. It cannot. You cannot save yourself. I cannot save myself. It's only by the power of Jesus Christ that we can be saved. But that principle, beloved, applies equally to those of us who claim the name of Christ, who are believers, who have come to faith in him. And we'd say, yes, I'm a believer. When Paul wrote these letters and he said, I'm addressing them to the saints, positionally, those who are separated into God, that's me. So they're addressed to me. But how many... Christians, after we have become part of the kingdom of light, beloved, revert to dark behavior, thinking that's the way to get what we need and what we, what we want. And so we compromise, and we begin to disobey the commands of God. We know that God says, you shall not covet. But we think, well, all I want is just, I just want a car like my neighbor has. I don't want to degrade the neighborhood. I need a new car. Even though there may be other things that are needed, I, I, I need that new car and I want that new car and I'm going to have that new car because I covet. And it's okay because I deserve it after all. If only I could make director in my company or manager or vice president, whatever the title is you're aiming for. If only, I could, if only I could get there, even if I have to stab somebody in the back to get there, then I could be happy. And think of all the... Think of how much greater witness I could have for Christ because I have a more exalted position. Yes, think about that. Or, surely God will understand. My husband doesn't understand me. John at work, he understands me. Surely God will understand why I need this relationship. Let me assure you, beloved, no, he does not. He's given his command. We're trying to think that evil will cast out evil. We're trying to think that our accommodation, that our rationalization, 
And our compromise will somehow bring God's good into our life. I assure you that will not happen. You can't get good results by bad means. You can't. You can't cheat and think I'll get an A and that God's going to reward that somehow. God's blessings do not come through compromise. God's blessings come when we Obey him in spite of the fact that it's hard and it's difficult and it doesn't even seem right sometimes. When Christians go rummaging around you know, in, the, in the garbage piles of this world to try and find their happiness and to try and find their joy, avoiding the ultimate source of satisfaction and joy, which is God himself, we're going to destroy our lives. We're like, we're, we're, we're like this cartoon I saw, this, 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 this dog, he... he he, he's clearly, he's been drinking out of the toilet bowl, right? And, and he, he looks up with, with water dripping down and off, of his, off of his chin, and the bubble above him said, man, it doesn't get any better than this. That's a Christian drinking out of the wellspring of what the world has to offer in terms of pleasure and happiness and fulfillment in disobedience to the laws of God. You know, it isn't, it isn't just... It isn't just for later that we obey God, beloved. Life now is better. When we obey God, you can't get God's blessing. You remember what Paul, what, uh, what, what uh, Samuel told Saul? Remember in first, first, it's 1 Samuel 15 because of time, we won't look at it. But 1 Samuel 15, God tells Saul, the king of Israel, I want you to go out and, and kill the Amalekites. Now before you get mad at God for doing that, God had already told Abraham, 400 years later, your people are going to occupy this land, but that's only going to happen after the Amalekites have 400 years to get their act together and to repent. So God didn't just arbitrarily overnight decide to wipe out the Amalekites. And if you read the accounts, the, 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 great, the, 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 uh, the great archaeologist, Sir William Ramsey, said I, can't even, he said, I can't even write in a book how bad these people were that were living in Canaan at that time. Certainly, let alone talk about it in a mixed audience. And God said, okay, the time has come. 400 years is long enough. I want him wiped out, and I want you to go down there and do that, Saul. And so Saul went down, but he saved the king, and he saved the animals, remember? Because why? Because he wanted them. And Samuel said, well, when, when the Samuel the prophet came to the king, he said, what is, how, what's this bleeding I hear in my ears? And the king said, oh, well, yeah, I, I, I kept a few of the animals for sacrifice. Remember what Samuel said? He said, Saul, you missed the boat. God's going to take the kingdom away from you because you didn't obey him. What you didn't realize is that to obey is better than sacrifice. What God is looking for is the sacrifice of obedience before he gets any other kind of sacrifice. You can't compromise and get God's best. Whatever game of compromise you're playing this morning, whether it's as a believer or as an unbeliever, I can assure you that the end is the way of destruction. You don't really want to go down that road. It may look great now. It will not look great later. Evil does not cast out evil. Second, second principle. Victory requires a savior. Victory requires a savior. We need a savior. Jesus gives a very short parable, beginning in verse 21. He says, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. Obviously, in that parable, the strong man is Beelzebul, Satan, right? And Satan is guarding his palace and his captives. Who are his captives? Now, please listen closely, because I know as you sit here this morning, you think you're not a captive of Satan. I must tell you, on the basis of the Word of God, if you've never come to faith in Jesus Christ, you are a captive of Satan. Jesus said it this way in John 8, verse 34. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. You think you can call it off, and you can't. You're enslaved. People outside of Christ don't feel like slaves. They walk the world like anybody else. They drive their cars. They have their fun. They enjoy their parties. It doesn't feel like a life of slavery until the end comes and the price has to be paid. And all of a sudden you're going to realize I was a slave to sin all along. Satan is doing all he can to hang on to those 
who just, he doesn't care if they, he doesn't care if you're into witchcraft or, or into the worship of Satan. He just cares that you're worshiping self. That's all it takes. And if that's what you're doing, then he's got the doors barred, he's got the gates closed, the, the moat is filled with alligators, and the chains are locked. It's who you are. And there is no escape. And he gives you just enough pleasure to keep you from even noticing your condition. See? That's the way he works. And Jesus is saying, if that's the condition, this strong man has you under guard. You know, Satan even uses the, the good things in life to enslave us. I, I, was, I came across this, this article a man named Ralph Barton, some of you, well, I don't know, if you're, I'm not highbrow enough to read New Yorker magazine, but if you do, perhaps you've run across him. He was a, he was a very successful cartoonist for the New Yorker. I don't read it because I don't understand about half of it. Even, even the cartoons I'm struggling with. But he was a cartoonist. He committed suicide a couple years ago. He left a note. Listen to this. I've had an exceptionally glamorous life and I've had more than my share of affection and appreciation. The most charming, intelligent, and important people that I have ever known have liked me. Yet, I have run from wife to wife, from house to house, from country to country, in a ridiculous effort, listen to this, to escape myself. To escape myself. No one thing is responsible for this suicide and no person except myself. I did it because I am fed up with inventing devices for getting through 24 hours a day. Beloved, it's not just the down and outers that are down and out, it's the up and outers who are down and out. We just don't realize it until suddenly the price has to be paid. Suddenly the Lord turns on the lights because the Bible says until we come to Christ, we're living in darkness, we're living in blindness. The only answer is a savior. That's why he says in verse 22 then, but when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. These captives couldn't rid themselves of captivity, but Jesus can. Who's stronger than Satan? Jesus is. He demonstrated it multiple times a day in his earthly ministry. You know, the Bible gives several reasons why it says God came in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ to live 33 years on this life. But one of those is given in 1 John 3.8. In 1 John 3.8, John says, the reason the Son of Man appeared was to destroy the works of Satan. Satan is the strong man. Jesus is by far the stronger one. To reject Three years of evidence that he covered the known earth with is to willfully and purposely deny the grace of God. I love verse 20. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. I love the phrase, finger of God, don't you? Finger of God, the weakest part of our anatomy. <laughs> what Jesus is saying is, it doesn't take anything for me to cast out a demon. Your exorcists go through their spells and they go through their exorcism incantations and they wrestle with them and they argue with them and they spend hours in prayer and they do all this stuff and all I do is say, be gone and they're gone. Just a flick of my little finger because that's the power of God. Can't you see the kingdom of God is here? Can't you see by the way that I have been going around the countryside healing people, casting out demons, speaking the word of God to you, preaching to you, showing you how the Old Testament predicted who I am? Can't you see that the kingdom of God is here and are you going to reject it after I have been day after day after day after day after day showing you how can you reject that? The Bible says in Hebrews, how will we escape if we neglect so great salvation? You won't. 
Salvation is of God, belongs to God. People who say that God never gave any evidence have never bothered to read the New Testament. Turn with me to Hebrews. You know, here's, here's where the victory was really won. Hebrews chapter 2. Since then, therefore, the children share flesh and blood. He himself likewise partook of the same things. Verse 14, by the way. That through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. That is the devil. How did Jesus ultimately destroy the power of Satan? Through death. Through his death, he destroyed the one who has the power of death. Now listen, dying wasn't the only piece of that, right? If he just died, he didn't destroy anything. But there was an empty tomb three days, three days later, right? Demonstrating that he truly had destroyed the power of death or the one who had the power of death. And then he can what? Verse 15, deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. The only delivery from the slavery of Satan is the power of Jesus Christ. That's the ultimate victory at the cross. He won this. Satan is strong. Jesus is far stronger. That's why there's no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. It's not by the power of Mohammed or Zoroaster or Vishnu or Buddha or Joseph Smith or Lao Tzu or anybody else you want to name. They're just men who died like other men. No one else died specifically for our sins. No one else came back alive from the dead, demonstrating that God was putting his stamp of approval upon that act by which Satan was ultimately defeated. Only he can remove us, beloved, from the power of the kingdom of darkness. And as a believer... As a believer, only he can keep us consistently living up to our family name as a Christian. He's the only one who can take away the, the anger, the bitterness, the anxiety, the selfishness, the lasciviousness, the lust that's in our heart, the addictions that plague us. We can't do it ourselves. We need to visit the cross daily. Milton Vincent in his book, The Gospel Primer, he says this, he says, there is simply no other way to compete with the forebodings of my conscience, the condemnings of my heart, and the lies of the world and the devil and over, overwhelm such things with the daily rehearsings of the gospel. Reminding ourselves daily that Jesus is the stronger one who can deliver us from the hold the enemy has on our life. Victory demands a savior. Third principle. Back in Luke 11. Neutrality is fatal. Neutrality is fatal. Actually, it's worse than that. Neutrality is non-existent. It's an illusion. There's no such thing as neutrality. But we think there is. Look at verse 23. Whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me Scatters. What's Jesus doing here? He's, address, he's addressing the fence sitters. He had some in that crowd. They're trying to make up their mind. I say, do I go with, do I go with God or do I not? Do I go with Jesus or do I not? Do I believe in him? He keeps saying, I've got to believe in him. Do I believe in him or do I not? And he's, what he's saying to them is, listen, guys, uh, what I can tell you is there's no middle ground here. It's not like you can say I'm not for Jesus, but I'm not for Satan either. I'm just in the middle. Nope, not, that, that place doesn't exist. There is no place of neutrality. You're on one side or the other. You're in the kingdom of darkness or you're in the kingdom of light, but, you, but there's no middle kingdom. To refuse his lordship isn't to declare neutrality despite the fact you would like it to be or that it looks like that. It is to declare against him. That's Jesus' point. 
Pilate wanted to be neutral. Look at Matthew 27. Back up two books to Matthew 27. Remember Pilate? The Jews brought Jesus to him. Pilate was in a political dilemma. The Jews didn't care for him, but he didn't really care, except that occasionally they would get so fed up that they would send delegations to Caesar, and if they could make a good enough case against the governor or some other Roman uh, a person, they might get removed, because Caesar, frankly, didn't want to be bothered with local politics. So if the guy couldn't take care of it himself, he didn't really care about the facts, he'd just get rid of him, put somebody else in there. And Pilate knew he was not on the Jews' good side in the first place. He was an evil man. He was a... He was a... He was, he was, he was a... He was a mean man. So the Jews brought Jesus and they made their case, but Pilate said, I don't, I, you know, it doesn't seem guilty to me. They were trying to make the case that he was against the Romans and he was trying to set himself up as king against the Roman Empire. And Pilate says, I, I just don't see this. And he went through various gyrations trying to deal with it. Remember, he sent him off to Herod for a while to get an opinion. He kept vacillating. He finally came up with the idea. He said, look, at the Feast of the Passover, we usually release a prisoner. I'll tell you what, it's either Jesus, who basically is just going around doing miracles and healing people, or you can have Barabbas, the guy that murders people. Which one do you want? Thinking, of course, that they would surely take Jesus over Barabbas. And, of course, the crowd took Barabbas. So now he's really in trouble, right? His wife weighs in on the issue. Matthew 27, look at verse 19. His wife sends him a note. She says, I have nothing to do with that righteous man. For I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. She's saying, yes, I dreamed about him, Pilate. Turn him loose. But Pilate, when he talked to the Jews, figured out he wasn't going to win that battle. So look what he says in verse 19, in verse uh, 24. Pilate then took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Pilate declared neutrality. When it came to Jesus Christ, he declared neutrality. Here's what Billy Graham writes about Pilate. He said, tradition tells us that Pilate spent the last years of his life up in the mountains of Switzerland washing his hands constantly. When someone asked him, what are you doing? He said, I'm trying to wash the blood stain of Jesus Christ off my hands. Beloved, the sad thing is, for all eternity, Pilate's going to be washing the blood stain off his hands, but it won't come off. Jesus' blood wasn't just shed for Jesus. It wasn't just an accident or tragedy of history. Jesus' blood was shed for the sins of the world. And so the, so the teaching of the Bible is you can't ignore the death of Christ. It will either save you or it will condemn you. And you will be separated from God eternally trying to wipe the blood of Jesus off your hands. It's a stain that sticks. There's no escaping Jesus' death for us. It either condemns us or it saves us. Listen to this quote, closing. Peter Kreeft in a book called Heaven, he says this. Listen carefully. The escape from, from worldliness is made urgent by the fact that we are already embarked on our journey to the other world. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying, listen, I, I, know you're, I know you're surrounded by this world. I know you're, you're drawn in by all the pleasures and advantages and all the rest of it of this world, by the values of this world, by the whatever of this world. But he says, let, let, me, let me tell you what reality is. Reality is you're already launched to a different world. You're on your way. It's just a question of time. You're on a journey to another world. As soon as we are born, we begin to die. The world is like a rocket ship. We are already launched into the beyond. Life is an escalator, and there is no way off except at the end. 
The only choice is between directions, up or down. Jesus put it a little differently. He said, you're either on the broad way to destruction or you're on the narrow way that leads to life. One of the two. There isn't any middle ground. Neutrality is fatal. No decision is a decision against God. Remember what Elijah said the day that he called fire down from heaven in that battle against the prophets of Baal there in the Old Testament? He said this, he said, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. You must choose, beloved. Choose Jesus. Choose Jesus. You know what's going to happen when you choose Jesus? You're going to turn around and you're going to find out you thought you chose Jesus and it turns out he chose you long before the foundation of the world, long before you were ever thought about, long before you were ever born. It's how much he loved you. But from a human perspective, it's up to you to choose. Let's pray. Father, this is, um, this is kind of a hard sermon in some ways, but really it's just, it's just facing up to realities that we don't, Number one, we don't have the chance to face up to them very often. Certainly our world isn't going to put these kind of options before us. But number two, they are, I think more importantly, they're realities we don't really want to face up to. We don't want to know this. Lord, if we just would think ahead far enough and realize, well, wait a minute. My day of accountability really is coming. There is, there is a day. I'm not going to live forever. I've seen loved ones die now. I've seen others go on. So I know that my day is coming, and it certainly is. And the Bible is really, really clear on this. It says, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. It doesn't say after that, nothing. It doesn't say after that, automatically, heaven. It says after that, the judgment. So we need to be ready. Thank you, Father, for your patience in allowing us to live as long as we have, to have the opportunity one more time to say yes to Jesus Christ who stands at the door and knocks. Thank you. Help us as we sing this song together, Lord. May we do the, pray that you would do the heart work. Draw those that you have chosen before the world began, even this morning, to come to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.